Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so just to remind you where we were. Um, so we were implementing some simple classes. At the end of the last class, we had finished implementing two string for our point class. I guess we should finish off our other simple classes. Um, and so we can complete the implementation of the counter class. Right? And so when you're implementing the counter class, you ask yourself what methods do people want to use when they're implementing a counter. Right? So they probably want to get the value of a counter. Right? So if they're keeping count of something, they're, gonna, they're going to want to know what is the count. Right? They're going to want to be able to advance the counter by one each time. And then you might want to print a counter as well if you're debugging or for some other purpose. Uh, and so we'll implement to string for our counter class as well. And you'll see these are all super easy to do. Right. So remember our counter, it just keeps track of an int value. Our current constructor just sets the value to zero. Right. If you want, uh, if someone wants to get the value of the counter, you just need to return uh, that, the value of that variable there. So you can write return this dot value. Right. Alternatively, you can just re uh, write return value, and that's fine. The advance method is the only one that is even slightly, that you have to think about even a little bit. So the way the counter works is it counts starting from zero, it goes up by one each time. When it hits integer max value, you have to decide what's going to happen. Right? If you just add one to it, it'll wrap around to integer min value, which is a negative value. Uh, and the counter is supposed to keep track of physical quantities, so there's no, it should never be negative. Right? So instead, we're gonna wrap it around to zero. All that means is that you have to test whether or not, uh, you have to look at the value of the counter and decide, uh, should you wrap around a zero or should you just add one? Right? And so you can test, is the value not equal to integer max value? Right? If it's not equal to integer max value, just add one to it. If it is equal to integer max value, you want to wrap it around to zero. You have to be a little bit careful when you implement this method. Um, and so one of the common mistakes um, a lot of programmers will make when implementing this method uh, is that they'll do the test here incorrectly. Uh, so for example, um, it's not uncommon to see something like the following instead, right? So instead of testing if the value is uh, not equal to integer max value, um, a, lot of, a lot of new programmers will simply write, they'll simply increment the counter by one and then they'll try to test, did we go, far, did we go too far? Right, so now they'll write something like if this dot value is greater than integer max, sorry, integer dots max value. Uh, this one. Zero. So the following is incorrect. Right, that doesn't work because uh, if you increment value when the counter is already at max value, as soon as you add one to it, it wraps around back to a negative value. So that condition is never true. And this, condi this condition is never true anyway, right? That's always false because value is, uh, value is an int. The int is never, an int can never be bigger than integer max value, right? Max value is its maximum value. Uh, and so this condition will never be false. Uh, sorry, this condition will never be true. It's always false, right? Which means this line here never happens. Right. So this is the incorrect way to test for uh, whether or not um, an int value uh, is still inside of the range uh, of, in, uh, of int. Right. So test, is it not equal to integer max value? Right. And if it's not, go ahead and add one. Oh, and finally, there's our toString method. Now when you implement toString, it's up to you how you uh, decide uh, what the string representation of a counter looks like. So you, uh, here, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna return the string count, followed by a colon and a space, followed by the value. Right? You might choose to do something different, like put the count in square brackets, or in round brackets, or in braces, or something else, right? Uh, it doesn't really matter what you do. It should be convenient for whoever's using the uh, object or the class. Um, but uh, any reasonable string representation is normally acceptable here. All right, and finally, this stopwatch class. Uh, so the stopwatch class is one that's slightly tricky to implement. Right? Now remember what the stopwatch is, it's meant to um, represent a physical stopwatch, right? So something that you can start and stop and get the amount of elapsed time that's, uh, the amount of time that's passed uh, since pressing start. Um, 
you have to think about, you have to think a little bit about how you're going to implement the method that returns how much time has passed, right? Because uh, it, what you return depends on uh, the state of the watch, right? If the watch is stopped, then you can simply compute the start time minus the, sorry, the stop time minus the start time, right? And that gives you the total amount of time that's elapsed. If the watch is not stopped, right, so it's running, then you want to get the amount of time that has elapsed from now until um, since you pressed start. Right, so now you have to get the current time and then subtract that from the uh, starting time. Right. Okay, so remember our stopwatch uses, uh, keeps track of a start time and a stop time, uh, and their values are both long. Uh, it, the watch knows if it's running or not. Right. The start and stop time are in nanoseconds, so we probably don't want to work in nanoseconds. Right? We want to convert these to seconds. So I've got a constant here. Uh, is just equal to one billion uh, that I can multiply the um, that I can multiply the uh, the difference between the stop and start time so that I can get the time in seconds. Okay, so the start method starts the watch running, right? If it's already running, we don't have to do anything, right? So start does nothing if the watch is already running. So if it's not running, right, we need to record what the start time is. And so we just call nano time to get the current start time. Uh, and we set is running to true. Right. So not too bad here. Now if you stop the watch, right, so stopping the watch does nothing um, if the watch is already stopped. Right. But if it's running, we now need to record the stop time. Right. And then we need to set is running to false. Right. Now stop, uh, so the stop also returns how much time has passed. Um, since the watch was started, right? So that method is um, called elapsed. So elapsed is the method that returns the amount of time uh, that has elapsed, which is right here, right? So if you read the documentation for it, it says for a running stopwatch, the method returns the total amount of time in seconds uh, that have elapsed since the watch was started, right? Now, if the watch is stopped, then it returns the total amount of time uh, between when it was started and when it was stopped. Right, so now we have to look at the state of the watch to determine the correct amount of uh, time. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the current time. Right, so that's the time right now. Right, now if the watch is stopped, then I don't care about the current time. Right, I actually care about the stop time. So if the watch is stopped, I'm gonna set current time to the stop time. Right, and now I can simply compute the current time minus the start time and divide that by one billion. Uh, we have to make sure that this is all done um, in uh, double arithmetic, because right now current time, start time, and uh, billion, they're all long. Right, so if I compute this in a long arithmetic, uh, I'm gonna get integer arithmetic here. Um, I wanna return something like 1.25 seconds or something like that, so I wanna do this as a double. So again, there's this um, adding of 0, 0.0 to the current time to force this to be all done in double arithmetic. Right, you can put a cast in here as well instead. Right. Uh, and that's a functioning stopwatch. If anybody is a runner and has actually used a stopwatch to do something, um, you know that you can, there are, most stopwatches have a lap time feature, right? You can add this to the class as well. It becomes a bit harder to implement. Um, you got lots of free time on your hands. You can try extending this class to do some other interesting things like keep track of lap times. Okay, so we've got, all of our classes have one constructor, the no argument constructor. Normally when you're creating a class, um, people who are using your class are going to want to create objects and they're gonna wanna say what the state of the object is when it gets created, right? So for example, you might wanna say an int is five, right? Instead of always starting out with an int of zero and then setting it on the next line. So uh, adding extra constructors uh, lets users of the class um, specify additional details about their objects. So you're allowed to add multiple constructors, um, but the constructors all have to have different signatures. Right? And so remember what the signature is in Java. So the signature of a method or constructor is the name of the method or constructor followed by the types in its parameter list. Right? So for a constructor, they all have the same name, right? It's the name of the class. So what this means is your constructors must have different parameter lists. 
So if you look at the point two class, it might be nice if you can make a point and say what the coordinates are of the point when you make the point, right? So you'd let this, you would like to set both x and y at the time of creation. Right? So that's easy to do, right? You add in another constructor, right? That takes in uh, an x value and a y value, right? Now here I've intentionally named uh, the x and y, uh, the parameters, x and y, right? And when you do this sort of thing, right? Notice that the parameter names are the same as the field names. So you now have this problem of inside this constructor, what does x mean and what does y mean, right? Does it mean the parameter x or does it mean the field x, right? Does it mean the parameter y or does it mean the field y, right? And so the rule in Java is, is that the parameter always takes precedence, right? So here, x means that parameter x, y means that parameter y. The constructor needs to set the field x and the field y. So this is the one situation where you must write this in front of the parameter, uh, in front of a field name, right? This dot x equals x, so that value of x is equal to that value of x, right? And this dot y equals y, so that value of y gets assigned that value of y. Uh, you can't write something like x equals x. Well, you can write it, but it doesn't do anything, right? X equals x literally does nothing, right? It assigns that x its own value, right? So you don't want to write that. Uh, another common mistake is um, you'll uh, program will write x equals this dot x, and you don't want that either, right? That's backwards. So x equals this dot x sets the parameter x to whatever value that happens to be. Uh, so this is the memory diagram again, um, I guess for the fourth time now, right? So we'll just quickly go through it one more time, right? So when you make a point, uh, when you create a point variable P, right? You get a chunk of memory somewhere that can hold the variable, right? New allocates a uh, memory for the point two object. So there's your point two object, right? The constructor runs. When the constructor runs, it gets the argument of the, con of the newly created object. And that gets stored in the um, variable called, well, sorry, in the um, keyword called this, right? So that's the address of the object that's currently under construction, right? Uh, when you call the constructor, it also gets the value minus one and 1 1.5, right? So the constructor has, sorry, the constructor, uh, the constructor has parameters x and y, right? And those values are minus one and 1 1.5. The constructor then does this dot x equals x and this dot y equals y, right? So this up here, dot x, so that field there gets the value of x, so it gets that value there, right? And this dot y, so this, that field y gets the value of that y value, uh, gets the value of y from here, right? So it fills in the x and y values of the point. right? And then it returns a reference to the newly created, and then new returns a that address there, right? And so the uh, value of P gets set to 600A. Uh, and so this, um, this is actually quite common in Java. So it's pretty common to see uh, a constructor or a method where the parameter names have the same name as um, a field name. Uh, so it's so common that th this even has a special term in Java, right? So when you have a parameter with the same name as a field, uh, we say that the parameter shadows the field, right? Uh, shadows or hides or something else, takes precedence over the field, right? Whenever you have shadowing, you have to uh, use this to disambiguate which x do you mean and which y do you mean, right? Do you mean the field or do you mean the parameter? Right. You can also create a local variable um, that has the same name as a field. Where's point? Oh, yes, somewhere in point. Uh, let's cook up a, do, 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 do. what should we do here? Okay, so let's, let me temporarily replace this with something. Uh, so double x equals, this is the copy constructor. I'm gonna show you how to implement this later. So you can also create, uh, instead of a parameter, you are allowed to create a local variable. So a variable that's local to the method that has the same name as a parameter, right? And so um, inside the method, if you make a variable, 
that whose name is the same as a parameter, the, met the variable name takes precedence over the parameter again. Right? And so you, again, you have to, in this particular case, you have to write this x equals x uh, and this y equals y. We'll come back to this constructor in just a minute. Okay, so once you've got that constructor, it now makes your class easier to use. Um, so someone who wants to make a point with a specified x and y coordinate can just call your constructor and you get a point with a specified x and y coordinate. Right? So instead of making a point whose coordinates are 0, 0, and then setting the coordinates of the points on the next line, right, you can simply replace all that with one constructor call, um, and away you go. Right? So it makes your classes uh, a little bit easier to use. A copy constructor. So it's very common that you want to copy an object. Um, so the copy constructor is the thing that lets you copy another object having the same type as the object that you're making. Right. So the copy constructor, it always has the name of the class, right? And it always has one parameter, right? The parameter is usually this exact same uh, type as the class that it's being defined in, right? So the point two copy constructor would have a parameter whose type is point two, like that, right? So this constructor copies the x and y coordinate from other and takes those coordinates and assigns it to the newly created point. Right. So the x coordinate of this point become, uh, is equal to the other, the x coordinate of the other point, right? And the y coordinate of this point uh, is assigned the value of the y coordinate of the other point. Right. So that's one way to write that constructor. Right. Another way to write that constructor was back here. Right. So go in and make a variable, get the x coordinate of the other point, right? Make another variable get the y coordinate of the other point, and then do the assignment. Um, notice that you're allowed to access the field x belonging to the other point, right? So remember that field is private, but you're inside the same class, uh, right? So you're inside the point two class itself. So inside the point two class, you can access the x and y coordinate of any point two object. So it's not just this point object that you can access, right? It's any point two object that you can access as long as you have a reference to that point two object, right? So other dot x is fine here and other dot y is also fine here. Right. The copy constructor, again, it's there to make your class easier to use, right? So here, here's an example, right? So we make a point using our second constructor up here. So its coordinates are minus one and 1.5. That constructor right there is the copy constructor, so it copies P, right? assigns the copy to Q, right? and when you print them out, you see that P and Q, right? they have the exact same coordinates, but they're independent points, right? so P is separate from Q. So if you change P and print P, right? P has changed. Right? When you print Q, right, it still it remains the same as when it was constructed. Right? Independent objects, they have their own state. Right, you can change either object's state um, independently of the other. Right. All right, so if you go and look at the three constructors for the class, so let's go do that. Let me put this back to what it was. Like that. Okay, ignore the instances plus plus. That was uh, done for some other reason. Um, so our first constructor, Two lines of code, right? Assigns this x and this y. Second constructor, two lines of code, assigns this x and this y, right? Third constructor assigns this x and, sorry, other x. Uh, oh wait. Other x and other y. Right. So all three constructors are doing the exact same thing, which makes sense because all constructors do the exact same thing, right? They all set the fields of your newly created object, right? So that kind of means that we're repeating ourselves over and over and over again, right? We're basically doing the same operation over and over and over again, right? And you know that, or you should know, whenever that happens, you want to avoid that from happening. Instead, you want to write a common method or function or constructor that does all of the work, 
and then just call the common constructor or method or function. Right? Whoa, sorry. What's going on? Okay. So whenever you see duplicated code uh, in a program, right, you should normally consider moving the duplicated code uh, into a method or something that's common that you can call. Right? If you think about the situation that we're currently in, one of the constructors does everything we need it to do. Right? So that second constructor that we implemented, right, this one right here, right? this lets us set the coordinates of the point to any specified x and any specified y. Right? So this is the most general constructor that we have. If there were some way to reuse this constructor from here and from here, then that solves our problem of code duplication. Right? So Java has a mechanism to do exactly that. Right? It's called constructor chaining. Right? So a constructor is allowed to call another constructor. Uh, when you do that, it's called constructor chaining. Right? It has a particular syntax um, to, uh, to uh, when you're using constructor, uh, to use, sorry. There is a particular syntax for constructor chaining. Unfortunately, it reuses the keyword this, right? And so, which is a little bit confusing, right? Because now this has another meaning. Right? If you want to use constructor chaining, it can only happen in one place in your constructor, right? It must happen on the first line of your constructor body, right? The only time you can do this, right? So the only time you can call a, con uh, you can use another constructor by writing this is from inside another constructor, right? You can't do this from a method, right? If you're in a method that needs to make a new point two object, you just call one of the point two constructors, right? So new point two, blah, 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 blah. So using this to invoke a constructor, the only place you can do it is on the first line of some constructor. Right? And so that lets us rewrite our no argument constructor and the copy constructor uh, using constructor chaining. Right? So instead of this x equals zero and this y equals zero, we can write this. So that takes the place of the constructor name, right? round bracket, round bracket, zero, zero. So that line there causes that second constructor to run. Right? And this constructor sets this x and this y to 0 and 0. Right? In the copy constructor, we can write this, and then round bracket, round bracket, other x, other y. Right? And so that line there causes the second constructor to run. And the second constructor sets this x to other x, and this y to other y. So that's, the, that's a simple example of constructor chaining. Right. Now, in this particular case, you might say, look, we didn't really save a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of work. Right. There used to be two lines here, now there's one. Right. And there used to be two lines here, and now there's one. Uh, and that's true. So constructor chaining doesn't buy you a whole lot in this particular example. If you have a class, though, that has many fields, or if some of the fields are difficult or, uh, to uh, initialize, Right? Uh, that's when constructor chaining really helps. Right? So for example, if the second constructor uh, ends up doing a lot of uh, computation to initialize its fields, right, you generally want to avoid repeating that code over and over and over again. So that's when constructor chaining would be very useful. Right? Here it's simply uh, illustrated. So with this particular class, not super useful, but it illustrates the technique. Any questions? The syntax is weird, right? Like, it uses the keyword this to call the constructor, right? which is a bit funny. Um, but that's the way that they uh, decided to implement this in Java. Any questions about chaining? OK. You can do the exact same thing in the counter class. right? So in the counter class, instead of starting the counter out at 0, you might want to start it out at some other positive value. Right. Similarly, you might want to copy another counter. Right. If you want to, you can use constructor chaining uh, again to remove any code duplication. Right. In this case, it's really not going to help you at all. Right. Because each uh, the constructor only has one line in it. Right. Uh, and so, here's our 
copy, sorry, this is our constructor that sets the value of the counter to some specified value, right? So not zero, uh, sorry, some non-negative value, right? So our counter always starts, uh, again, it represents a physical count, so its value can never be negative. So if you're going to provide this constructor, you have to make sure that the incoming value is not negative, right? So if the value is less than zero, we're gonna throw an exception. You might choose to do something else, Right, so you might choose instead to set the value to zero. You might choose to take the absolute value of the value or something strange like that. Right, here we're gonna, I've elected to indicate that this is an error. Right, and only once you've validated the input do you actually assign uh, the field uh, to the incoming value. Right. To copy another constructor, right, you simply call, uh, we're gonna use constructor chaining to call that uh, constructor that we just implemented, right? So we're gonna pass in the other value, uh, the value of the other counter, uh, and let the second constructor set the value. So here's an example when you should not use constructor chaining, right? So notice that the no argument constructor simply calls the second constructor passing in zero, right? The copy constructor calls the second constructor passing in other value. If you're, in this if you're using this constructor, you already have a valid counter object, right? So you already have a counter whose value is not negative. There is no need to test that value. Right? Similarly here, right, we know that the zero, that's not negative. So there is no need to test that zero. If you use constructor chaining, you're always testing the incoming value, right? And so you are paying the price of that test uh, unnecessarily in both cases. Now, the cost is not very high, right? It's one if statement. Um, but you're still paying this price unnecessarily every time. Uh, and so in this particular case, constructor chaining doesn't really, uh, there's no advantage to using it. And in fact, there's a very small disadvantage to using it. So in simple classes, you typically don't need to constructor chain, right? In more complicated uh, classes where the initialization is more challenging, uh, that's when constructor chaining is useful. There we go. All right, um, so that's more or less, uh, so that's basically how to implement simple methods, how to implement various constructors. Um, are there any questions about implementing simple classes so far? Okay, so we're on now on the, to the next deck of slides. Um, and this one, doo -doo -doo, called classes continued. Uh, and so, we finally reached the point uh, where you can we can talk about documenting code. Um, so documenting code was not a new idea when Java was invented, right? So people have been documenting code since we've been writing code. Right? Um, Java was, uh, I guess it was unique, and it's the first major language uh, where you would embed documentation into the code itself. Right, and that documentation can be extracted from the code to produce readable um, electronic documents. Right. So Java was born basically when the, at the start of the internet, um, or when the internet first started to become uh, more commonly used. Uh, and so uh, the creators of the language realized that they could put the documentation online. And so they created a tool and they decided on a convention for documenting Java code that would let them produce these documents automatically. Right. So that tool that reads your code uh, or the comments in your code and extracts the documentation is called Javadoc. So the way this thing works is it processes these special comments. Right. And so you'll, no you'll have noticed that in uh, the source code for point two, for example, there are these big block comments in front of uh, the class, in front of our fields, and in front of our constructors and methods, right? The block comments start with slash star star, right? So the slash star star indicates a javadoc comment, right? And then the star slash indicates the end of the comment. Star, uh, sorry, slash star just indicates the start of a multi-line regular comment. So it's ignored by Javadoc. So Javadoc is looking specifically for stuff that starts with slash star star. 
the stuff inside the comment, it's just text. Right? You're allowed to put, you're allowed to use HTML, well, a subset of HTML, if you know what HTML is. Right? If you don't know what HTML is, don't worry about it. No one's going to ask you about it in this course. Right? So when you write these javadoc comments, uh, basically you're describing something. Right? That's what documentation is for. So the first part of the comment is some sort of description of the thing that you're documenting. So when you document the class, right, there's a description of what the class is meant to be used for. So the point two class is meant to represent a two-dimensional point, right? That constructor there initializes a point uh, to the coordinate zero, zero, and so on and so on and so forth. Right? The first sentence of that description, that gets copied into the summary section of your documentation. Right? So... So when you look at a uh, Javadoc document, right, um, at the top of the class, sorry, at the top of the documentation, right, there's sections called summary, right, field summary, constructor summary, method summary. Right. The first sentence of every description, that's the thing that shows up here, right. So the first sentence of the Javadoc for the for that constructor ends up being, uh, uh, ends up in the documentation here, right? The rest of the uh, comment ends up in the detailed section. So down here, that's where the remaining uh, documentation shows up, right? Uh, a doc comment is allowed to include these things called block tags. So anything that starts with an at in a Java doc comment uh, is indicating something special. Right, so at param, at return, at throws um, are examples of block tags. Right. So when you're writing, uh, when you're documenting a class, you always start by documenting the class itself. Right, so you describe what is the class used for. Right, uh, you might describe what its capabilities are and other things like that. Right, so for our point two class, uh, we've got a one sentence, our, our one sentence a description up here. Right. In professional quality code, you would expand on this, right? You would explain, um, you might explain um, what the point two is, what this class is capable of, right? When you might use it, you might give examples of its use and things like that. What doesn't go up here though is how is the class implemented, right? And so uh, documentation is not, Javadoc documentation is not meant to indicate the details of the class, right? the inner workings of the class. It's meant to describe what is the class for, how do you use it, right? So up here you would not say a point consists of a double X and a double Y, right? You want to avoid describing how the class is implemented, right? So it's what the class does, not how it, not how it does what it does. Right. So when you run the Javadoc tool, and it sees a comment like that, right? That shows up here at the top of the class in the class description section. If you have public fields, uh, then you should document those fields with a Javadoc comment, right? If you have private fields, um, then you normally don't comment the uh, fields with a Javadoc comment, right? Or you can put one in, um, and then you tell Javadoc not to generate the documentation for the private stuff. So for example, in the math class, right, there are constants e and pi, they're both public, right? So anything that's public should be documented, right? So the javadoc comment uh, for e is right there and the javadoc comment for pi is right there, right? If you look at the math class documentation, right, in the field summary section is where you see the first sentence of each description, right? Um, the comment, oh sorry, if you're looking at a, sorry, if you're looking at um, constants, they're a bit weird. Uh, so am I. Okay, so if you click on pi, right, and you're hoping to find out what is the actual value for pi, it doesn't tell you down here. 
right? If you want to see what its actual value is, you now have to follow the second link here, right? And so that's where you can see its actual value, right? And so now you can see that for math, where to go here, right? Now you can see e and pi. Right, so the, it's, a, it's a bit funny that they chose not to show you the actual constant value in the class itself. Okay, if you have a public constructor, you should have a Java doc comment that, does, uh, that describes what is the purpose of the constructor. Right, the first sentence shows up in the constructor summary section, the rest of it shows up in the detail section. Right. So there's the Java doc comment for the no argument constructor. Right, when you, oh, sorry. Uh, right, so this one is going to, uh, so the, uh, this is going to show up in the summary section and the detail section is also going to look exactly the same, right. If your constructor has parameters, now you have to, you should describe the purpose of each parameter, right. And so the way you uh, document each parameter is with this at param tag, right. And so these tags come after the description section. Right, so describe the purpose of the constructor, now start to describe the parameters. Right. So there, uh, we have at param and at param because we have two parameters, x and y. Right. The name of the field goes here and here. Right. There's no symbol in between. Right. So there's no period or colon or anything else here. Uh, Javadoc will insert a symbol here for you when it generates the documentation. Right. So at param, name of the parameter and then a description of the parameter, right? Normally descriptions are quite short, right? Uh, and you'll often find, a, a, you'll, often real, um, you'll often think that the description is kind of unnecessary, right? Uh, so for here, it's kind of obvious that x and y are the x and y coordinates of the point, right? But uh, good practice is to describe uh, briefly what these things are anyway. Notice up here, uh, there are some funny braces and, uh, again, these at tags here, right? Uh, and so this right here, uh, this at code thing inside of braces, it simply formats the stuff after at code that's inside the braces uh, using a different font, right? So this will show up in a monospace font, so a typewriter style font. Everything else shows up in like a, um, a proportional font. Right, so it reads like a nicely formatted book. This looks like computer code, right? This reads like regular English text. I think there's an example, here it is, right? So anything in that uh, at code, uh, anything that's marked um, with the at code tag shows up in a different font like that, right? And so this just sets off or makes it easier to read um, stuff that is supposed to represent code. You don't have to do this in this course, right? Um, so I don't care if you format your code like this or not, right? If you end up writing professional, uh, if you end up writing documentation as part of your job, um, your job will probably require you to format stuff like this right, to make it easier, to make it nicer to read, right? Again, I don't care if you do this or not, right? The copy constructor, right? It has a parameter, so document the parameter with an at param tag. So at param other, name of the parameter, right? A description of the, what other represents, right? It represents the other point for copy. Right, when you run Java doc on that, you get the constructor summary section that looks like that, right? You get the detailed section that looks like this. So the no argument constructor, not so interesting, but the two argument constructor, that's a little bit more interesting, right? It had, an at, it had two at param tags, so now it, that documentation shows up here. If you're doing this in Eclipse, uh, you don't have to remember all of this stuff. So let me nuke that uh, comment here. Right. So most uh, modern um, software development environments uh, will be able to generate the a Javadoc tag for you. Right. In Eclipse, you can go to the source menu uh, and uh, there is a, where is it, generate element comment. Right. And it fills in, uh, it's, it fills in, it gives you an empty comment uh, for you and it correctly fills in the, um, it correctly inserts the parameters for you. Right. 
Uh, and so uh, that's kind of handy, right? Now you just go ahead and edit the, um, e edit the comment, right? So initializes this point uh, to the specified coordinate. Something like that, right? And then you fill in uh, the um, description of the parameters. Right, and the y. Like that. Right. So uh, Eclipse is capable of generating any Java doc comment for you. Right. You just point at the thing you want to generate the comment for uh, and then go source uh, generate element comment. If you have a public method, you have to document the method as well, right? So describe the method. Uh, you're going to describe its parameters. Now methods also return values, so you're gonna return, you're gonna describe their return values as well. Right, so the parameters are documented the same as for a constructor. The return value is documented with an at return tag. Right, so the set method has two parameters, new x and new y. So they're both documented with a param tag, right? It returns a reference to the point, so that is documented with an at return tag. When you generate the documentation for that, in the returns section, you now get a description of the value that's returned. And I think finally, uh, if your constructor or method throws an exception, you should tell people under which conditions will the exception be thrown. Right, so that gets an at throws tag. So the counter constructor throws an exception if the value is less than zero. Right, so the, you document uh, the exception with at throws. That's the exception type that can be thrown. And then you describe when it is thrown. Right, so this throws an illegal argument exception if the value is negative. Right, and so all these comments that you saw in lab one and lab two uh, these are all Java doc comments, right? There's going to be one lab where I ask you to write the Java doc comments and then I'm never gonna ask you about it again, right? So you're not gonna see it on an exam, you're not gonna see it on a quiz, right? But there will be a lab where you have to write Java doc. Um, you're allowed to insert a subset of HTML into these things, right? If you don't know what HTML is, don't worry about it, right? But you can put in things like simple lists and uh, you can have separate paragraphs and things like that. Right. If you want separate paragraphs, you just start each paragraph with a less than p greater than. That's the HTML tag for a paragraph. Right. So for example, we have an add method in the point two, well, we haven't implemented this yet, but there is an add method in the complete point two class that adds a vector to a point. Right. So here I've broken off the, uh, I've added a separate paragraph uh, to describe exactly what you would use this method for. So this particular version of add is useful when you want to write something like p equals p plus v, right? So this is telling you that this add method changes the point where you, that you use to call the method, right? So p dot add v is equivalent to p equals p plus v. Okay, so it's unlikely that many of you will end up in a professional Java um, job. You might, you never know. Um, if you do end up in a professional Java, uh, um, a job that has you programming professionally in Java, they're almost certainly gonna require you to document your code. Uh, Java is unusual in that there's actually a um, set of recommendations for how you should document your code. Right. Most other programming languages don't say anything about documentation. Uh, if you click that link there, that will take you to a surprisingly long document that suggests how you should document your code. Right. All right, I think that's enough for today. Yeah, that's plenty for today. Um, the, I guess the next part, the, so the rest of this lecture uh, is related to software engineering. Uh, so you're gonna, I'm gonna introduce some concepts that um, are fundamental to software engineering, um, but might seem a bit odd at this point. But um, we'll talk about that in the next class. All right. Okay, so if I don't see you tomorrow in the lab,